This is the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, anyplace. And now, from the Hour of History studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello, and welcome to Hour of History podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and co-hosting with me today is... Keith Riley, hi, I'm <laughs> Keith, back. Keith's back, yeah, um, he's back, and we're here to talk about a theme that we've both noticed popping up in our study of history and in current events lately, um, something that we're both kind of interested in, we were just sort of talking about, yeah. is this idea of resentment. Right. Resentment in history as a theme of people just being angry, everybody against everybody else. So uh, the reason this sort of came up is um, I had, of course, read Pankaj Mishra's Age of Anger, The History of Present. Anyway, he has this big idea of resentment. He uses the French word so he sounds smarter. Mm. But um, basically the idea is that people are just mad that you don't, people aren't getting what people want to have. Um, so what do you think, Keith? Where have you seen this recently? Um, so, yeah, the last time I was on, we were talking about the Sandinista Revolution. Um, and this past uh, weekend, right, starting like on Thursday, um, in Nicaragua, there were some big sort of changes to Social Security there in which um, in order to kind of save the system long term, there are reports, I mean, I, that I'm not sure are verified, but like rumors floating around Nicaragua that sort of uh, Ortega, the leader of Nicaragua, has sort of um, emptied out the, the funds that Social Security subsists on, right? He's kind of stealing the money for himself. These are kind of rumors floating around. But anyways, it all it all uh, resulted in right pensions being cut in the um, immediate sense, right? People getting less money, people. The, the, so it's just a, a big change to the system. Um, and protests started, I believe, on Thursday, starting at um, some two colleges uh, in Managua, right? The college there, uh, La Uca, as they call it, like the Universidad de Centro America and also some two colleges in Leon. Um, and these protests, right, while they started as sort of a backlash against um, the changes to Social Security, they, they quickly sort of evolved into a sort of um, entire rejection of the um, Ortega administration, right? And that's important in terms of our conversation because Ortega uh, was one of the San leaders of the Sandinista revolution. The Sandinistas are back in power now, as we talked about. They get reelected in 2006. Ortega is in power now. Just won his third reelection, right? Same year as ours, 2016. Um, there were the big, you know, vast rumors that this election was a sham. His vice president is actually his wife, right? Yeah. Just like in House of Cards, and actually in Nicaragua, <laughs> the most popular show is House of Cards. For like you know that reason yeah um so the rumors are right that ortega is sick he wants to carry on his legacy right um so you know when he dies his wife will take over his wife has the same politics as him in order to get the christian vote in nicaragua at the time they go towards the right they illegalize abortion so now you will be thrown in jail if you are a woman and you need to get an abortion um uh, like I said, right, land has never been redistributed to the peasants after 1990. Um, right, so, Ortega gets rich off the land that was formerly collectivized. So basically, right, in short, I know it's a lot, but basically the Sandinistas are a very different sort of, more sort of neoliberal party than they were in the 1980s, right? And people are, people are upset about that. Yeah, so uh, people, and we kind of left off our conversation, uh, well, we began our conversation talking about how people weren't given the necessities that people needed in order to survive in the first place, and that was why Samosa was brought right. down, and there was this promise, at least of the Sandinistas, and at least international support um, that for a regime change in order to sort of, uh, you know, get people their necessities uh -huh. um so what if i was someone in in nicaragua who uh let, let we can look at this from a few perspectives yeah. what if i was someone who like fought for the revolution right am i taking to the streets i've seen images of guys is that like what do you think about that sort of representation i mean that's like 
that's what makes me like kind of the most sad about it sort of like uh, it, it is like a sad situation i think um because you know like the people i mean there are reports right of, of clashes in the street much like we saw in venezuela last summer right in which um the sandinista youth group right the sort of um youth wing of the party right is attacking these students who are protesting the changes of social security in the street people in terms of history right people put a lot of stake in their sort of linkage to the revolution and their like participation in the guerrilla struggle to overthrow samosa um and because of that right the sort of um re-election of daniel ortega in 20 in 2006 right was really seen by these people that fought for the revolution as a victory right they still identify with the memory of the sandinista revolution and the kind of most prominent um encapsulation of that right is ortega and they're being I mean, if I can be partisan, right? They're being kind of screwed over by Ortega. But the the sense is that they're still sort of they're conflicted, right? Because there's they fought for the Sandinistas in some shape or form, right? So what about that? And so there's clearly like a resentment of the failure of the revolution from that perspective that like it didn't live into the ideals or or the life basically didn't change for the better, at least not as good as you wanted. Um, what about the people who left Nicaragua, uh, you know, who might have been Somoza supporters or, you know, whatever? What right. do you think their perspective on this is? Oh, well... Do you think they feel vindicated now that Ortega is is acting, you know... Maybe so. Maybe so. Or but... probably just sad to see Nicaragua yeah. still struggling through. Huh? Yeah. But, I mean, I, I think, right, the, the main issue here is that... Ortega moved rightward. Ortega became a kleptocrat, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that is not indicative of the revolution um, and the revolution's failures, right? Because in its initial incarnation, I think the revolution accomplished really important things um, and was a good thing for most Nicaraguans at the time. I think now, right, the Ortega that is ruling over Nicaragua is a very different uh, kind of iteration of the Sandinista party. Well, yeah, so yeah. let's keep that thought in mind. <laughs> okay. And then because we, uh, recently also, it, this was the anniversary of the Bay of Pigs just right. last week. Yeah. And Raul Castro uh, promised, you know, that he was he seated the presidency while he remained the head of the Communist Party. And that's sort of something we had a big uh, Cuba conference here at Temple. And one of the main themes that kept coming up was this, the, not only the sort of like promise of the revolution, or, but, but also the Castro staying in power and holding right. on to power no matter how, how the economy has been in Cuba. And there's sort of this sense of Cubans in Cuba that, right. that resent the sort of successful uh, Miami Cuban stereotype. Mm -hmm. And on the reverse, the exile Cuban community resenting the Cubans in Cuba because they're still in Cuba. Right. So, so there's this enormous tension between both groups that right. no, no one's happy. Right. And, and even with this change in power, the question is like, well, the, I mean, clearly Cuba has not become the socialist paradise that it was you know promised to be right. and um like where do you go from here type right thing well so what do you think like i heard you and matthias talking the last time i was listening to that awesome cynthia nixon episode yeah we talking... Cuomo, cynthia yeah nixon yeah yeah debate. that was a great debate <laughs> um but you you like brought up that castro quote right when he came into power right um the history will absolve history me. will absolve him and like you and matthias were talking about right um castro's like imprisonment of gay cubans right right which is obviously like we should totally condemn that um i was like one like with this new person coming to power yeah like what do you think about that kind of transition what is it symbolic? Should we look at it as a shift? And also, right, 
Do you think the Cuban Revolution is sort of a mixed bag? Like, are there difficult, like, well, different things to unpack? Yeah, for sure. Okay. And, like, I, I think we talked about it a little bit, but, like, one of the things is, like, the, the literacy campaign. Yeah, and, yeah. And the New York Times has just written an article a couple of days ago about how there are more black people in power in Cuba than any other, like, Central American nation, Caribbean, right. not Caribbean, but Central American nation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a problem that's been in Latin America where you just have, you know, the white white Latin Americans right. that are that are ruling the countries um, Cuba sort of you know leveled the playing field in that way it also you know the the rural urban divide in Cuba is not as big because mm -hmm. all the programs of like building up Cuba are sent to you know Santiago and the cities yeah. outside of Havana right so there's definitely those kind of things and and the literacy I mentioned and, and the health care and things like that right. um, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, but so that's sort of like the, those are the pros of the right. revolution. And right. there was real pride about it. And, you know, we heard some compelling talks uh, at the conference about sort of describing how, you know, these, these guerrillas were like all young, attractive men who right. were like, they, and they won the war, you know, they uh -huh. beat this big dictatorship. And there was, there was a, a mythology around the gangsters running Havana mm -hmm. that may or may not have been true, but mm -hmm. people believed it. Yeah. That, that there was vice in these cities right. and, and that was largely kicked out. But then uh -huh. with, the, with the Bay of Pigs and the blockade, you know, people really thought they were going to die. Mm. People thought thought you know because with <laughs> with the cuban missile crisis it yeah. was like um okay the world's gonna end mm -hmm. so there's that whole thing and and yes so then castro remains in power through all these generations you have no other foreign leaders stand up to the united states like this for six yeah. generations and remain in power mm -hmm. and um when the shift of power happened it's kind of interesting to see how the news uh agencies portray it because these are day-long you know communist uh gatherings where there's speeches after speech that's long and long you know so there's right. tons of sound bites and you end up getting like a 200 word washington post article that has like three quotes mm. and somehow we're supposed to garner the deep meaning mm. so like i've been following multiple reporters on reuters mm -hmm. and someone mentioned a really dark joke that real castro made uh he he told the incoming um president uh miguel diaz canal that uh you're the only one of your generation who survived Hmm. Which what does is that like, mean? Yeah, yeah, because the typical comment would be like, "Oh, Raúl survived because they oh. fought in a revolution mm -hmm. and they lived to be ninety. You know, mm -hmm. these guys survived. Right. But you wouldn't say that to the next generation. But in a way, it makes sense because the people born in the revolutionary era have mm -hmm. endured so much mm -hmm. from the Cuban Missile Crisis in their young childhood yeah. through the worst years of the regime, through the reform, and then through the fall of the Soviet Union and the special period in the nineties. So in a lot of ways it's even more remarkable that a person like uh miguel diaz canal can survive than these revolutionaries right. which is kind of counterintuitive but i know yeah. news agencies really picked up this bite it was just a, a twitter thing so it's kind of interesting i don't think there's enormous i mean there's a lot of questions he has to come up to but facing resentment so this new president has yeah. to face the sort of like anger of the Cuban American exile community, the wrath of Donald Trump, and right. his, and not to mention the Cubans who want things like internet, and you know they yeah. want to be modern. So yeah. it is, it really is this sort of age of anger where people are just on. It's uh, it's not an enviable position to be entering into the presidency in Cuba. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah, because <laughs> you think about these leaders who. Um, regardless of your rhetoric, the challenge that we sort of put on leaders to turn countries around uh, is extraordinary, wouldn't you say? Like, how much do we expect one person or even the system to change? And we could use this sort of rhetoric with with Nixon or Cuomo or Trump or any of these people come promising the world and they're playing off that populist resentment that like people are so mad when Nixon says she's going to fix the subways. Right. They're like, hell yeah, that sounds good. How do you fix a system that was built in the 1800s? You know, it would take a total rebuild. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I'm saying is... 
it's dangerous to play off this resentment. And I think a lot of politicians do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, well, I guess in terms of Nicaragua, um, the resentment sort of, I, I worry that, um, and I guess this speaks to your point, right? I mean, I don't want, I, I hate Ortega, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and Ortega is actually, he, in terms of speaking to the accomplishments of the Cuban Revolution, all the most wealthy Nicaraguans get all their medical care done in Cuba because it's like the most sophisticated, locally based medical system that exists, right? Besides the United States. And he can't really go there. Um, but the thing is that I worry about, like, the, the, the resentment about in Nicaragua um, is that if Ortega gets replaced, right, the Sandinistas right now are really the only sort of really strong party in Nicaragua that exists. And in part, that's because of political repression. But I think, right, one of the reasons that I, you know, I hate to say it, but Ortega has been good is that he is a strong leader and that kind of strength um, in comparison to kind of countries like El Salvador, countries like Guatemala, whose kind of state apparatus is pretty weak, yeah. right? That has allowed the drug cartels to come into those countries, essentially take over kind of the police apparatuses in cities like San Salvador and Guatemala City. The In Honduras, the same thing, right? Um, the drug kind of murder rates are out of control there. Nicaragua is pretty peaceful, right? right? The kind of, uh, the, 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 the huge influx in minors coming to the United States, right? Um, they're not coming from Nicaragua, right? And it's because, right, uh, Ortega and like the strength of the Sandinista party as it exists right now has not really let the drug cartels take over the state well this is kind of like a like a sort of scary thing and, and when people evaluate the revolution and revolutions that have happened they're sort yeah. of quick to jump on like yeah i mean the the revolutionary regimes typically kill a lot of people they typically retake property and you know redistribute wealth and all of those things are not good to be on the wrong side of right that's clear that's common knowledge um but then the sort of Hi, uh, hypotheticals or counterfactual histories that like what how bad could things you know it's easy to imagine and people I find people often use the argument of oh things were so good and things were going the right way but without any real evidence uh, that these kind of things were going the right way you know yeah so the only thing really that in a lot of cases that's scarier than these situations is what happens next yeah. So, like, uh, you know, are these doomed to be failed state? Like, because you think, too, and this is where it might be useful to go even farther back in history. Mm -hmm. Like, it's easy to point the finger now in the second half of the 20th century and say, well, the revolution did not go as planned and now it's a failed state. But to me, I s sort of see that as a, like a short view of history because we're not talking about like, uh, in Cuba's case, it was it was used as a treasure box for the Spanish. Who, yeah, like it it was they didn't yeah build the nation up type thing. You know, they used it for to exploit and they took pillaged it basically. Right, and I don't think it's like totally. I mean, maybe this is what you're saying too, right? I don't think it's like totally fair to say that like Nicaragua and like Cuba are like failed states, right? Because while there are really bad things happening in those countries, right, uh, Nicaragua and Cuba both provide free medical care to their citizens, right, something that the United States does not do. Um, I know that Cuba, right, their sort of approaches to handling hurricanes, right, has they've, like, transported people that kind of deal with hurricane-related disasters to, like, other countries in the Caribbean when Hurricane uh, Maria. Maria was happening yeah. and stuff. I mean... To me, that's that's important, right? Those are important things to stress too. Even though, like, there are 
like bad things about these countries as well. Absolutely. Right? And it's interesting to hear the narrative. So like if you're tuned into all the US news sources and so like just a scroll through Twitter this afternoon and I saw a bunch of, you know, young males in Nicaragua like shooting guns into the air. Those are the images that we're getting. Right. Um this morning I listened to uh, Radio Havana and they were talking about how Puerto Rico went all last week without power. Right. So this is a part of the United States that had no electricity for a week for a hurricane that happened last year. Yeah. And the new hurricane season starts in June. Right. So like, so from their perspective, you're right. Puerto Rico has like San Juan is you know beautiful right. and like they've re redone the old San Juan and like right. it's a tourist hotspot. But at the same time, we can't get simple like disaster response back. We can't put them back on a grid. It's shocking, and mm -hmm. from that perspective, it's sort of shocking. So I think we have to be mindful of how we're consuming our news right. and and sort of like. You're right. Maybe. And if you listen to the Hour of History Cities podcast, mm. I talk about how Havana was implementing things. The government in Cuba was implementing things in Havana, like urban farming uh -huh. that is now looked at as like, well, why hasn't the whole world been urban farming in right. Philadelphia, New York, Los Angeles? These places are now trying to start urban farming. Havana was doing this in the 80s, the 70s. Huh. Yeah. That's awesome. I didn't know that. It's really cool. So as we get closer to this, environmental apocalypse some of these things that we used to portray as like fail state syndrome right. is just it's just a non-industrial sort of and this is kind of what Mishra critiques is like having a trajectory or this like progressive view of history where we're always going towards modernization and progress it, it just does it's just not complex enough way of understanding the world right yeah, so right. I think we might be in a situation again like this in uh, Cuba. We'll see. We'll see what happens going forth. But then it's easy for me to say, you know, because we have all these all these resources. Right. Do you feel that there's this sense of resentment uh, around in other places, like in U.S. politics, in general world climate? Um. I mean, absolutely. I'm trying to, like, grasp on to, like, some concrete example. I mean, there's... Yeah, I mean, it's everywhere, right? With the Cynthia Nixon stuff, right? The populist sort of um, backlash to kind of the... Um, what was Matthias talking about? How, like, sort of there's, like, four families that, like, op that, like Run rule everything. over uh, the Republican and Democratic Party, right? I, there's a lot to resent. I mean, I've been talking about like, and this will get us into a different place, right? But my classes, like we've been talking a lot about sort of um, the police power and how sort of post 1970, right? Millions of dollars, right? Um, have, you know, been flooded into like federal dollars, right? Into police departments throughout the United States, right? And police departments have used those dollars to kind of, uh, create enhanced surveillance techniques, right? Uh, police have more heavily and more heavily African-American in your city neighborhoods. Um, so to me, right, that Black Lives Matter is a response to that, right? Is, a, is indicative of some sort of resentment, right, of, of the um, past 30 years of federal policy in regards to police departments. So that's like... The, just because I've been teaching that, that's been on my mind. And what do you find the response? Do people do people hear that and say, okay, then Black Lives Matter is someone who's angry at the world, who's angry because this has, you know, because there's been something wrong in the world. Do they draw a connection between that and say, uh, what would be the opposite of Black Lives Matter? Blue Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Do they draw a connection between that? Do you see those as the same? Like, we have disaffected people on both sides. Like, we could take Italy as an example. They had yeah. an election in March, and both the far right and the far left populist parties, right. they're not even far, they're more yeah. centrist, but right. they both won, and they haven't formed a government yet. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, people are just anti-everything? Is that fair to say? Yeah. I, yeah, this is depressing. Well, no, I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I, it's tough because, like, 
I feel like the kind of the iterations of power, right, as they exist in most places have been so consolidated for so long. And I feel like, like the Matthias the other day was talking about austerity and stuff. I'm still kind of thinking yeah, about yeah. These, the conversation you guys had. Um, and, you know, we're living, we're living in a time, right, in which there's, you know, more money spent on defense, right, and less money spent on social services, right? People get less and less from their governments, right? Um, but are still paying taxes, right? Uh, I mean, I guess with tax bills, right, the, the idea is they're paying less taxes, but, right, the idea is they get less and less back from their governments, right? Um, and I think that that breeds resentment, right? What are, what are, what are we getting back? Are there any... <laughs> I don't know, I'm kind of going everywhere here. Are yeah. there any exemplary states that, that do get uh, services from their government? Like, like is, should we be looking in places other than government to give us these services? Uh, because it seems to me, and yeah. this, I kind of went on this way with Matthias okay. too. It's yeah. like people put their hope in these figures, like whether it be Nixon or Cuomo or yeah. Castro or, or Ortega, and the figures let them down, whether it's because they're incapable or whether it's because they're liars and frauds. It, should we just not put faith in, or should, maybe we should... Should we not put faith in figures? I just, so this is a question I posed today. I used the example of Gandhi in my class. Okay. And first of all, I was shocked that not a lot of people knew the story of Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a perfect way to teach this resentment through the character of Gandhi. Right. Because Gandhi is, he's easily accessible. There's, there's statues of Gandhi all over the world. Right. And he's this contradictory figure where, like, Gandhi does boycott movements of yeah. Britain. His salt march is all about boycott. And, you know, yeah. it echoes of America first. Echo, you know, like he's saying India first. His quit India movement right. was anti-British. You know, we can provide for ourselves. We can make our own clothes. Right. And so there's that sort of thing. Like, where, So he's really fueled off the people's anger as well. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, but then you throw into it the controversy. So recently they put a statue last year of him in the University of Ghana campus. Oh, yeah. And people protested because in the tomes of volumes that he's written, right. he's used discriminatory language right. towards Africans, you know, and, and there's the whole question of if we're judging people by today's standards, you know, for something that happened 100 years ago. Yeah. But there's also the reality and his his sexual experiments he did with his nieces and mm -hmm. like to test his brahmacharya, his mm -hmm. not having sex vow. Mm -hmm. And that's like, these are real questions of oh, yeah. should, should we put faith in, in figures? But at the same time, how many people like Martin Luther King Jr. drew inspiration from Gandhi? I mean, funny you should mention that. Yeah, like I, I think that's like such an interesting yeah, question right like the, the 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 stock we put in these kind of huge figures another one of my favorite podcasts to listen to is on the media like that wnyc does and they just did this interesting segment um on the anniversary of the 68 assassination of king mm. where they were talking about people that wrote letters to king and people like wives who had spouses that were cheating on them would write to king and ask what should I do? My husband isn't interested in sleeping with me. I'm pretty sure he's sleeping with this other person. And King would write back to these women and say, well, have you like thought about what you're doing? Maybe you're like <laughs> doing something I that I this woman who your husband is now sleeping with is doing. Are you spending too much time with your kids and not paying enough attention to your husband's needs? You know, so when we examine these people, right, they become flawed right like and there we should never like put like so much stock in like people that they become yeah the problem with kind of like idol worship and kind of heroes and things like that right that um you know people are never as perfect as like they're made to look right yeah. But at the same point, like at the same time, like I feel like they, they serve, they do serve a useful sort of like, they could be used positively. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, you know, 
I so I have, and this is what's interesting too is I the best thing about teaching is you get to present these kind of things like you know it's fun to have conversations like I'm having with you about it, but it's fun teaching you get to present these ideas to a lot of people and get a lot of different opinions. And I've had students who are so repulsed by Gandhi and so repulsed by what he's done that they don't want to learn anything more about him. They yeah. don't want to talk about him. They don't want to see him. Mm -hmm. And I've had students who are so inspired by Gandhi that yeah. they're going to change the world. And, you know, they want to start, they want to have their own salt march and mm -hmm. make their own clothes, you know, do things like that. So, uh, is there a happy medium or is this just sort of that resentment on both sides? Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> when I was thinking of like, uh, oh, in my mind, like just this kind of critique of leaders, right? Some of the, the, the kind of um, political moments that I get most excited about are like these kind of uh, uh, moments in history in which there are these sort of leaderless movements that actually accomplish like political goals. Like right? what's a leaderless movement that you're thinking of? Uh, like the Paris Commune. Or like during the Mexican Revolution when Zapata leads this group of indigenous farmers and retakes these like haciendas that uh, had previously been their land, right? They reinstall these indigenous councils, right? In which there are no leaders and sort of different groups of people are elected, right? Um, but they're the, the people who represent the council uh, rotate, right? Um, and these councils come together, they vote on things, things like the the... The Russian workers councils like prior to the establishment of the Soviet state um, So I guess right like kind of like an anarchist kind of view anarcho syndicalist kind of view of the world I know maybe it's not We could view it through the lens of skepticism, but it is interesting to see those moments in history right in which um, leaderless movements are able to accomplish political goals yeah well since you this you mentioned leaderless movements and anarcho-syndicalism i have to take it to spain now okay one of the interesting things was mariano rajoy who's the prime minister of spain uh was tweeting about uh nicaragua and, oh, cool. and yeah and he said uh it's so sad to see this happening in nicaragua we hope that they listen to the people and resolve this democratically. Yeah. Which, meanwhile, Catalonia attempted yeah. to hold a referendum democratically to which Spain declared Supreme Court, said, you know, it's not illegal. They invoked this law and they sent the police in. And now we have, you know, videos of the Spanish people, the Catalans being uh, beat by Spanish police. And at the same time, we have the Spanish prime minister, you know, talking about, uh, <laughs> talking about, uh, it, you know that we need to democratically resolve these things and the Spanish history is an interesting case going back to Franco and like you had the anarcho syndicalists and the anarchist groups rising up in Asturias and places like that uh, and it, it, the fear that that kind of not having a leader built up uh, in a lot of people you know sort of leads to these like reactionary great figures like franco you know who mm -hmm. rise up on the other side so i'm wondering if like our yeah. since if maybe the the system is kind of too big too big to have no leader yeah yeah could be because i wonder about like you know people are so attached to the yeah. coca-cola and their <laughs> yeah like it's true yeah I, I i don't know that's what i think of whenever i'm thinking of these like uh you know potential alternative models yeah because we're gonna have to figure one out no totally it is interesting so like two things like one thing like i was like when when i was oh man yeah i'm like i'm like a silly like idealist and like a socialist so like like when i was in nicaragua and like people were asking me like what is what's your favorite brand of shoes uh <laughs> i was like oh man thought like you guys were supposed to like have these like revolutionary ideals or something but that that's silly like people are people but um so what would you say i would say oh, i like converse or something <laughs> <laughs> you know i don't want to like were they the satisfied? Pot too much sure yeah yeah they were or i would like try and deflect and be like bashful or something be like oh i don't know huh. um well, the other thing I guess like the Zapatistas or something is some example that I think about in, in like southern Mexico and Chiapas, right? That that modeled their community very specifically after those kind of indigenous councils um, in Morelos that Zapata set up. Um, 
and they, they it's a leaderless movement they've been there since 94 right they still hold that same land that they took over in chiapas um and while the mexican government right is totally hostile to them constantly like cutting off their supply of water and things like that right they govern themselves according to kind of um indigenous traditions and things mm-hmm. like that and it seems to work out for them uh apart from the Mexican government constantly trying to Mm -hmm. um, undermine their authority. A lot of times when we're like talking about these conflicts, we've sort of talked about the, where you draw the line and the periodization. This is what this makes me think of. Um, We all, when, like, when do we start history? A lot of times, like when, if we, when we started talking about the Sandinistas, we started with Samosa, right? Yeah. I've done podcasts with Matthias. Like when we started talking Cynthia Nixon Cuomo, we started like in the 90s. You know, I wonder a lot. I often wonder like if we always start too recent, you know, in the the sort of narratives. Do you ever feel that way? Like, um, do we ever start to. Like, like, wouldn't, like, uh, what name <laughs> are, do, am I, am I just going off? No, the no, I'm, I, I'm trying to, trying to get like, my fingers As far it. as, like, because you're talking about, like, these indigenous leadership yeah. style, that, like, we'd have to go way back to, like, pre- <laughs> No, I know, yeah, yeah. Pre-empire. Right. Or pre-enlightenment. Like, is it, and this is why, like, I was always interested in empire and sort of studying the enlightenment and, and the contradictions of it. Like, you know, Gandhi, Gandhi is, is okay, he's spinning his own cloth, he's wearing his, you know, his handmade thing and and walking with a stick and sandals. He has, like, ten possessions. One of his possessions, though, are glasses to read. Uh Uh-huh. Glasses, like, that's that's Western medicine, right? Mm -hmm. That's an invention of the Enlightenment. And he's reading and writing prolifically. He's a tight, you know, he's he's writing tomes and tomes. This is an Enlightenment thing to do. Right. So, like, just the, contra- the the contradictions of those kind of things are mind-boggling to me. So, and I feel like we're so worked into this this sort of uh, imperial world, this mm-hmm. this imperial system of mm-hmm. global networks and stuff that that the world is kind of long gone. Right. Which is why looking at uh, places like Havana and Cuba is so interesting to mm. me because whether they wanted to or not they're isolated Hmm. and north korea totally isolated and we get these weird things of like the demilitarized zone in korea is one of the world's best preserved wildlife refuges because no humans can go across it wow that's fascinating i did not know that the wildlife there is just untouched because they've been at war for 50 you know yeah. maybe once once trump resolves this war <laughs> then the fucking goodbye birds yeah goodbye birds yeah that would be sad so i wonder yeah. like i don't mean to be doom and gloom but maybe we should go back further in history mm. yeah yeah to get to the answers good i think we've solved everything okay here, Keith. <laughs> all <laughs> right great hopefully this was helpful thank you keith for joining me it was another wonderful day in the hour of history studios and remember hour of history it's our world anytime any place thanks for listening